The other project was Key 9029. That's the intersection project, the intersection of Snake River Avenue and Southway Avenue. And that pro was the project that started in 2004 and is just about to go to construction, hopefully. Mr. Flats, will the intersection project that uh, we're considering, recons potentially reconsidering, will it have the same project number and as any of the other previous projects? The project that that we're re or you might may be reconsidering, excuse me, will have the same project number. It will always be key nine oh two nine. Same key number. Same key number, same project number. Okay. There's a design phase of that, which we're concluding, and then there's a construction phase of it. Okay. And then that's what the second state local agreement was for, the construction phase, but I believe the key numbers are the same. Was the key number for the underground drainage and project number the same as this uh, intersection project? No. Was the underpass project as federally funded, did it have the same key number and project number you as know, this? Um, excuse me, Mr. Mayor, but I'm not really that familiar with the underpass project, but I know it wasn't part of 9029. Okay. That's what I'm getting at is that, again, uh, Mayor Pro Tem, that I submit to you that these are all unique standalone projects that are issued and administered by the Idaho Transportation Department and that their funders, funds are accounted for individually by project and cannot be intermingled or commingled. And so that they are a standalone entity. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Yes. You know, I, I think Councilor Stevenson brought up some good points, but Mayor Poole has uh, re repeatedly stated now that there isn't a conflict of interest. At this point, I'll take him at his word, but I, I, would, I would like to remind him that if his company, I'm not going to mention the company's name, has a possibility of directly benefiting from this project going forward, he should recuse himself. But he's, he's clearly stated that, there, that in his opinion, there, there isn't a conflict of interest, so I call the question. Question has been called for. Question is, or excuse me, the, the motion is to reconsider resolution 2012-27 to put on the active agenda as active agenda item G. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Motion passes seven to zero. Mr. Mayor, you may take charge of the meeting. Okay. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, for clarification, uh, that motion for reconsideration will be A.1. We'll discuss it after active agenda item A. Oh, okay. okay. Next item we have is presentations and public hearings. We have a public hearing for ZA0212. The applicant is the City of Lewiston. We have Mr. Joel Plaskin from Community Development. Thank you. Who wants to talk about chickens? <laughs> I, I thought you promised us we would never talk about chickens. Well, I'm excited now. Um, <coughs> yeah. so this is a, a code amendment proposal to uh, Chapter 37, the zoning code of the municipal code. Um, it's a project that started about a year ago. Um, I do have a PowerPoint presentation which I'll be walking you through. You've got a strikeout underlined version of the code amendment in your packets. Um, and the PowerPoint that I'm going to, to go through is a, is a summary of that. Um, the proposal has been posted on the city's website for some time now. Um, the original proposal, or the way this whole thing got started, um, was that staff had been receiving a high number of requests from citizens to have chickens in their backyards. Um, and so an idea was brought forward to uh, increase allowances for people to have chickens. Uh, that went through a public process which ended up resulting in a 180 degree turn um, and we were directed to impose further restrictions on um, places where you could have chickens. And so that's where it went. It was requested by the Planning and Zoning Commission um, that the issue be worked on by a task force, um, which, which I did put together. We do have at least a couple of members, members of the task force in the audience tonight. Um, they worked very hard on, on this over a long period of time and discussed a lot of things in a great amount of detail. Um, 
And of course, it has been to the Planning and Zoning Commission. They conducted their public hearing on May 23rd um, and recommended approval of the code amendment. Although the, the proposal was uh, originally designed to um, deal specifically with chickens, as we went through um, and worked on that, uh, there were some other sections of the animal rights um, regulations that uh, looked like they could be improved upon or clarified, and so uh, some changes related to procedures um, and grandfathered animal rights are, are included in this, and I'll go over those in, in some detail. The zoning districts that we're talking about here that are affected are the F2, the R1, and the R2A zones. These zones are, uh, well, at least the F2 and the R1 are almost exclusively located in the orchards. Um, Back there. Animals, uh, livestock are allowed by right both in the F2 and the R1 zones. The R2A zones uh, does extend down toward the normal hill area and conditional use permit is required for livestock in the R2A zone. Um, in the purpose and applicability section of the regulations, um, the proposal adds some more descriptive language to that uh, just to try to give a little bit more um, teeth and understanding to what it's all about. Um, it specifically exempts 4-H and similar pro programs uh, such as FFA um, and it would eliminate a reference to farming simply because farming is not dealt with in these regulations. It's, uh, it's uh, a term that actually is proposed later in the definition section to be moved into another section of the code just because it's not, um, not in the animal regulations and that's one of the clean, clean up items that I mentioned earlier. Also in the definitions, uh, we're proposing to add a reference to the English dictionary, so if there's a term that comes up, uh, we would default to that. Uh, definitional, uh, definition of the term animal is, is uh, being added to mean livestock. Livestock is already defined, but the term animal is used regularly and almost interchangeably throughout the regulations, and so we're just cleaning that up. Uh, as I mentioned, the definition of farming is being proposed to be relocated at another section of the code. That's in the general definition section of the zoning code. Um, likewise, with the term feedlot, uh, that's not um, dealt with in the animal regulations either, and so the proposal is to omit it from the animal regulations and again relocate it to another section of the code where it's actually applicable. Uh, livestock area, that term uh, is also proposed for amendment, um, and the amended definition would um, omit the um, the requirement to subtract the minimum lot size from the zone so that way when you're talking about uh, the amount of land area that someone has to have it's dealing just with the animal uh, the, the land area where the animals are or can roam or are kept um, and the minimum lot size required by the zone is, is not included in the definition of livestock area the minimum lot size for the zone though is still an issue and it is still included in these regulations um, and there is a minimum lot size required for the keeping um, of animals in, in the, when we get to the poultry regulations, um, I'll show you that. Um, of course, since we set out to deal with chickens, um, we added a definition um, because in the current code there is no definition of chickens or poultry. Um, and so we're proposing to add that definition. I want to point out that the definition that's being proposed does not include turkeys, it does not include waterfowl, it does not include guinea fowl and does not include roosters. Uh, the task force felt like those um, types of birds were, were um, perhaps more offensive or in a different category and so they're not, uh, not, not included in the definition because they don't feel like they should be regulated in the same way as, as chickens. Um, another definition uh, proposal is to remove uh, a size standard from the definition of the term stall um, and one of the reasons for that is because it's typically not a good idea to include standards within a definition. Um, you want to be able to allow people to apply for a variance if they can't meet a standard, um, but you can't apply for a variance from a definition. And so that's another cleanup item there. Um, when you look at the part of the uh, proposal that is entitled Maximum Allowable Number of Animals, uh, one thing you might notice is that ostrich, ostriches and emus are being added. Uh, the task force talked about it and, and thought that those two particular types of birds, uh, again, should not be regulated as poultry. They're 
uh, probably a little bit more intrusive or at least much larger birds. And so um, we, we wanted to be able to allow them. Right now the code doesn't mention them at all. And it was thought that they were similar uh, perhaps um, in impact to neighborhoods that they should be included with sheep, goats, and alpacas. And so that's where they're <coughs> proposed to be grouped with or proposed to be grouped. Um, the allowable animals section also includes a proposal to allow uncastrated male goats by conditional use permit. Um, we understand that those particular uh, types of goats can have an unsavory odor that may travel um, some distance, um, but that in some cases, cases they may be um, okay. Um, but then that would only be allowed by the conditional use permit and public hearing process. And even with that, um, only on a two acre minimum lot and with a 75 foot required setback. As far as limits of birds, uh, numbers of poultry, uh, again, we wanna talk about the different zoning districts. Uh, there are two zones where you can have uh, chickens by right. That's the F1 and, and the uh, R, I'm sorry, the F2 and the R1 zone. The F2 is actually an agricultural zone. Um, and the R1 zone is a suburban residential zone. Both those zones allow the keeping of chickens by right. Um, in those two zones, which tend to be more rural, um, the proposal is to require a 7,500 square foot minimum lot size to start with, um, at which point you can have 10 chickens. Um, and then you can have an additional bird for every additional 1,000 square feet of lot area, up to a maximum of 50. And again, that's in the ag and the suburban zones. In the low density residential zone, the more urban of the three zones we're talking about, the R2A zone, um, again, 7,500 square foot minimum lot size to start with, um, gives you 10 birds, but you're capped at 15, okay? Because it's a, it's a more urban type setting than in the other two zones typically. Um, and just by way of reference, what that means is if you were to um, be allowed to have 50 chickens in the F2 zone, um, under this proposal, you would have to have a 1 point acre or 1.1 acre lot to do that. Um, in the R2A zone, um, to have 15 birds, uh, you're looking at a 0.29 acre minimum lot size to have the maximum allowable 15 birds. Pullets, uh, birds are under 12 weeks in age. Um, the proposal would be to not count them, to allow people to replace their chickens. And uh, so as long as the number of pullets that, that you wanted to have didn't exceed the maximum number of allowable full-grown birds, then you could have them and not exceed the regulations. Uh, the proposal also says that you, wouldn't, uh, you would only be able to allow, to ha only be allowed to have the pullets uh, th between the end of the first week of May uh, and the first week of September, a total of nine weeks. Um, that actually uh, is a result uh, of some work by the Planning and Zoning Commission on a specific application for a conditional use permit where that was discussed at great length during the public hearing. The proposal adds a requirement that in order to have chickens, you have to have coops and runs. Um, the proposal includes minimum standards in terms of size for both the coops and the runs. And um, uh, it would pr um, require that coops not be located in the front of a house, have to be to the side or to the rear. Would require a 20 foot setback to a neighboring house or any patio or swimming pool or shop related to that house. Um, cleaning requirement f uh, for chickens. Uh, again, this is new. Right now, all this is new as far as the, the chickens go. Right now, there are no standards for the keeping of chickens. So these are all new proposals here. Um, have to clean at least twice a week, more in the rainy, se rainy season or if it's wet. Um, so that's a new requirement that's being proposed. Continuing on the uh, section with the maximum allowable number of animals. Um, it would specify that the requirements apply even to commercial operations, not just to family animals. So if you have more than you're using for just for your family, you still have to meet these requirements. Uh, some people like to have uh, livestock and, and use some of the, 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 uh, the meat and or eggs uh, for farmers markets and other types of things or for home occupations to sell them. 
the proposal would clarify that the minimum amount of land area that you have to have for, for multiple types of livestock is a cumulative requirement. Right now, it's not clear in the code, and that question has come up a number of times, so we're trying to clean that up. So for an example, if you wanted to have a goat and a horse, and those are addressed differently in these regulations, if you have the half acre minimum that you need for the horse, you can't say that I have the half acre for the goat too, you gotta have the half acre for each. Um, so that, that's an attempt to make that more clear. That's the way it was administered in the past, but to wanna take advantage of this opportunity to actually put it in the code. Um, if you're looking through the strikeout underlined version, you're gonna see that there's a no nuisance clause that's being stricken. <coughs> Don't panic, that's just being moved to another section of this, uh, the same regulations, and you'll find it later. Uh, same thing with grandfathered animal rights. Um, that, that's um, shown as stricken, but it's being moved to further back in the regulation, and it's also gonna be, or it's proposed to be uh, <coughs> extended in terms of the amount of guidance uh, there to establish grandfathered animal rights, and we'll go over those uh, in more detail as well. Maintenance standards, uh, the proposal adds a requirement that stormwater runoff not be allowed to go to neighbors or to streets. Um, it would specify that manure has to be either removed from the property um, or if it's gonna be com composted or, or used otherwise on the property that it only be done so without attracting insects or causing odor problems for the neighbors. Of course, there are other maintenance standards in there. I'm just going over the new ones. Uh, the section that addresses conditional use permits, like I said before, if you're in an R2A zone, you have to apply for a conditional use permit to keep <coughs> livestock. This proposal would clarify that the use permit approval um, allows all the animals that you can have under the regulations, providing that you meet the standards, unless the use permit approval by the Planning and Zoning Commission um, explicitly says that it's limited to a certain type and or number of animals. Uh, and the reason that's proposed that way is because um, the animal rights, the existence of animal rights on property, um, based on my observations and dealing with all the realtors in town over quite a, a while now, is that it really adds value to property, at least to the property that has the animal rights, um, and that they're, it's highly desired. Um, and so the allowable number and type can be limited, but it would be done by the PNZ um, as a condition of approval of use permit. And if it's not explicitly conditioned and limited, then if you get the, if you, you can ask for grant, or you can ask for animal rights, and if you ask for blanket animal rights, you can do that. It gives you the option to do that. Um, it would also specify that the use permit approval runs with the land. Um, that's not expressly in the code right now, uh, but it still can be conditioned to not run with the land. If the, if the public hearing, process um, reveals to the Planning and Zoning Commission that they feel like they need to limit it to a particular property owner or a certain period of time or what have you, uh, that they could do that as well. Um, the proposal also says that um, if the, if the um, animal rights aren't used for two years, then they become null and void and you gotta start over. There's a section in there right now under conditional use permits that um, talks about exceeding the allowable number of animals. The proposal would eliminate that um, because it creates uh, some confusion and what could be determined to be an inconsistency in the code. Um, you can apply for a conditional use permit um, to have livestock um, and to, to keep them in a manner um, in other ways than just the number of allowable animals. Maybe it's the type, maybe it's the, um, the placement of the animals on the property, what have you. It's, it's not, I don't think it was originally intended to just be applicable to the allowable number of animals. The use permit process can be used for a broader, um, uh, for broader issue, set of issues than that. Uh, the proposal also specifies that if you have a changed circumstances to your conditional use permit approval. Um, in other words, if you want to increase the number of animals, if you had a condition that it, that it be limited, that you have to apply for use permit approval again. You can't just do it. Um, a lot of the language in there has to do with grandfathered animal rights. The existing code has a very short clause on it 
Um, and we wanted to try to add further guidance um, and increase um, public opportunity for public input on the granting of grandfathered animal rights. And uh, so you'll see quite a bit of new language that's being proposed in there. Um, basically, uh, under this proposal, neighbor complaints um, where there are not documented grandfathered animal rights would trigger a requirement that the property owner apply for approval for grandfathered animal rights, um, which if you read through the process there, um, you'll see that that could result in uh, requiring a conditional use permit hearing, depending on um, what the neighbors say to the notice. And that's similar to what we do right now and have been doing for a long time on detached accessory buildings. You can build up to a certain square footage um, and beyond that, administrative uh, the administrator notifies the neighbors and if there's an objection then it goes to conditional use permit this would be similar to that um, let's see here grandfathered animal rights could be done administratively um, if the property owner can demonstrate that they've been there for five years um, the current code says that they had to have been there since 1993 <clears throat> um, so this would allow more opportunity to apply for grand opportunity for people to apply for grandfathered animal rights because it significantly reduces that amount of time that they would have to have been there. Um, and then if they had the animals there for less than five years, then they could still apply, but they could they couldn't do it uh, administratively. I couldn't do it. It would have to go to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, this proposal would also add a requirement that the zoning administrator make a finding that the situation, uh, the, the keeping of the livestock is consistent with the um, purposes of the code. And it would specify that where uh, there's a change in the increase to the number of animals. So if I grant grandfathered animal rights to somebody after having gone through this process, notify the neighbors, et cetera, uh, and then later the property owner changes from I don't know, from, from one type of animal to one that's more impactive to the neighbors, or if they add the number of animals, or if they relocate the animals on the property to where it does cause a problem for the neighbors, then it, the code would say that they, they can't do that with having to get a new approval to make the change. Uh, and I already mentioned it before, but the proposal would require uh, the zoning administrator notify the neighbors of an intent to grant grandfathered animal rights. Um, and if there is a protest received about an administrative approval for the grandfathered rights, then that would trigger a conditional <coughs> use permit hearing in front of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Um, and similar to the use permit, if the uh, grandfathered animal rights um, are not used for two years, then they become void and they would have to start over. That is uh, my summary of the uh, code amendment proposal. Um, be happy to answer any questions for you now or later. Mr. Plaskin, how, how do you document that the animals, how, what kind of documentation or proof is required that animals are on property every year? There, is, there aren't any specific requirements as to what type of documentation um, is required. Um, it can vary. Um, it can be statements from neighbors. It can be statements from private property owners that are notarized. It can be photographs, receipts. Um, uh, private property, uh, tax records, um, uh, any, any variety of things. It's, it's nothing that's set in stone. It's really done on a case-by-case -case basis. Any questions of Mr. Klaske? Councilor Randall. Uh, I appreciate all the work, but one question I have is, how do you plan to enforce this? Who's going to do it? The same as has been done. Uh, the one person doing this? That's correct. Complaint? There's no change to the, to the staffing or... Um, and or what happens when somebody refuses to let you on their property and they have over the maximum amount or any mix that's not approved by this? Then what? That, I can try to answer that question. That's, that's not something that's proposed to be changed or part of this proposal, but... Um, there's typically a process that the code enforcement officer goes through in order to do that. And um, it generally starts um, in a, in a um, 
introductory way with a, an initial investigation to see what's actually out there. Um, if it's determined that there's a problem or it appears that there's a violation, then the property owner um, is notified. Um, and then generally, we ask, we, asked if we, we ask if we can be on the property. If we can't uh, be allowed on the property, we try to document um, if it's a violation in any other way we can. A lot of times the neighbor who's complaining will allow them on their property, in which case we can view the, the situation to see what's going on. Um, again, like the, the previous question, it's, it's nothing that's set in stone and it really kind of varies depending on the situation. Councilor Kleber. Thank you. So somebody say in the R2A, um, they've had animals on their property for 10 years. Um, how are they affected by the grandfather thing? I mean, do they have to go come down and actually get an application if, so they can say, yes, I've been grandfathered in because I've had animals for 10 years? If, if they change the nature of the way they're doing things um, to the point where it generates a complaint and then we investigate it and find that it um, is a bona fide complaint and causing a problem for a neighbor, in that situation, we will send them a notice saying that they need to go through a review and approval process. Okay. Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Councilor Daniel. Um, I just have a question for the city attorney. Um, it's probably a silly question, but my father was on the task force for this, so before I comment on it and vote on it, um, he's on the task force. Neither of us stand to benefit or be hurt by the passage or the non-passage of this. Is that is that okay? That's fine. All right. Uh, well, it's a fair question. But uh, um, earlier you said it was kind of a 180 degree turn. What led to that? You know, when I first came on the council, we had a meeting. You know, possibly gonna ease ease restrictions right. on, on allowing it. How did it all of a sudden get to this point where now we're tightening restrictions on people who already have them? Uh, like I said before, that was just the result of the public process in this particular issue. Uh, it started out with support from one side, and then it drew a lot of uh, opposition, and uh, that was just the outcome. Councilor, Mr. Mayor, Joel, if I didn't know you and the, and the group would work so hard in this, I probably would use the vernacular of my 13-year-old. Seriously? <laughs> <laughs> Seriously? Um... I wish because I eat chicken that I could recuse myself. <laughs> um, you might as well quit I, right I, there. <laughs> I, I'm having so much difficulty understanding the benefits, and you mentioned one that's real clear to me. The realtors say that it helps the value of property because there are people who want clear animal rights and want to be able to purchase that. What does the rest of this document do that gives us something that gets me beyond seriously? Can you be more specific? I'm not quite sure I, I'm just, where your I, I, it, trouble is. I'm looking at this and saying, how does this improve the quality of life in Lewiston? And I know, I know you guys That's have worked hard That's a matter of perspective. Pardon? I said that's a matter of perspective. Uh -huh. I'm, I'm sure you'll hear about that during the public hearing. Well, I guess I'm going to wait to hear about it, but I sure wish you hadn't brought chickens back to us. <laughs> oh, my oh, goodness. Uh, my recollection is that the council was the one, yeah, the I group know. that <laughs> wanted me to do this. So. I think there must have been somebody in favor of an ostrich or an emu here. <laughs> Good heavens. You, you know, I, and I, I live in the orchards, and there were the McCanns, as you know, had had horses right next to me uh, for years, and I, I thought they were delightful to have. Uh, the only obnoxious animals we had were the cockatiels who learned how to bark following the example of my dogs. Uh, they were more obnoxious than my dogs once they learned how to bark. I know it's a matter of personal choice, and I know it's a matter of complaint-driven, but wow, I can't imagine. I, I think Councillor uh, Randall has hit it right on the head. I just can't imagine even coming close to controlling this in any way, shape, or form. But we'll, I guess we'll go through the hearing and find out, right? The, the okay. way, if I might just comment, the way that I understand this to be written, um, my feeling is that it will help us uh, in administering the regulations um, more than what we have in place right now. 
That's, that's good. I, I hope you understand it better than I do. Because <laughs> I don't. Any other questions of Mr. Plaskin from at this time. counselors? Okay, maybe back. Uh, at this time, we will open the hearing. Uh, taking testimony on ZA0212. Is there anyone to speak for or against this? Name and address, please. Oh, boy. I don't even know where to start with this now. <laughs> um, Lavetta Isley, 1303 8th Avenue. And I would just like to share a little story with you. It's one thing, you know, for you to hear all of these great things. It's wonderful, you know, to think that everything is going to be done just the way it is when it's printed. Hey, that ain't the way it is. And I'm going to tell you a little real life story. Uh, when I was growing up for many years, we lived at 415 6th Avenue, not too far from the hospital. Oh, and Counselor Brad Cannon's grandparents lived on 8th Street right there, too. So our backyard and their backyard abutted. They had the chickens. We didn't have the chickens. Now, there is no way on earth you can stop an, an animal or any creature from doing what it is naturally excuse me, born to do. And they can peep. Oh, and they take food in, and the food comes out. And let me tell you, it smells. It smells horrible. And, well, in the wintertime when it snows, it's not bad. But, uh, it, you know, we've lived that experience. My mother then went to the city council and with good cooperation from me. It was, it was okay there. Then no chickens were allowed in the city limits. It's been a wonderful 50 years. Now you can love your animal, but it doesn't mean I have to love it. And so, you know, I have a right, and everybody has a right to not have to contend with the issues that any of these kinds of animals, you know, will present. And it's, my recommendation would be for the council to amend, what is it, ordinance 4580 to delete all poultry or all chickens or, you know, make it some way there. Uh, fortunately, you know, horses aren't allowed downtown and stuff. Those have been under control for oh, quite a while. And the grandfathering uh, method has worked for all these years. And I think Councilmember <coughs> Randall brought up a good point in how on earth can you enforce this if all of these animals are going to be added to our population here in the city of Lewiston? They're nice, but they belong somewhere else rather than next door to you. And uh, it's, it's, I've had an experience. And it worked out. We got it done, taken care of, and I don't want to see it undone. Thank you. Any other people wishing to testify for or against this? Uh, Kevin Boswell. 1008 Cedar Avenue. I'm an R2A. So I'm zoned with animals and for 30 years I've lived in that area and had horses on both sides of me. I've had no issues. Fantastic. Uh, never had any problems with those neighbors. But recently, a few years ago, not too long ago, we've had a bunch of poultry move into the neighborhood. And to a lot of you that's probably not an issue. But at 3.30 in the morning, out your bedroom window, your wife gets woke up, your dogs get woke up, and you get woke up every single morning because of the roosters and the other ducks and chickens and the things that are going on. It is an issue. It is a problem. And it does lower my property value to people I want to sell it to. 
I can understand people's rights to have those, and they should have the rights to have animal rights, but I should also have rights to be able to not have to deal with that. So I think the crux of this is the teeth that the gentleman was talking about was it gives him some opportunity for me to call and say, I'm having this problem. Can you enforce this? Can you keep the, the waste from my neighbor's yard running onto my backyard? Can you keep me from at least getting a little bit of sleep at night, you know? And so that's what I'm thinking when I read this regulation, I read this proposal, is that it gives a little bit of teeth and control in our area so that we, as landowners, can kind of live in peace and harmony, not having one demand that they have these rights, but yet infringe on mine that I don't have sleep or my property smells or I've got flies and horses. And again, I haven't had any problems with living in the area I live in. I understood that when I moved there, that we have livestock. But there needs to be some kind of control over some of the other new things that are coming in. And as far as I'm concerned, having 50 chickens is probably a little more than personal value since each chicken lays one egg a day. That's, I don't know who eats 50 eggs a day, but okay. <laughs> but there should be some controls to hold that down. And, and that's what I'd like you to, you know, I want you to know that I'm really in favor of this ordinance to give a little teeth to it. Thank you. Mike Hill. I live at 1020 Cedar Avenue. Uh, I was on the committee for the, uh, the task force to look into the situation. The reason being, I'm one of the people, and I understand some of you think this is funny, but when you live next to someone that has 300 chickens, uh, three roosters, it's running onto your property, killing your garden, killing your, your, your lawn, it's not funny anymore. Uh, so I was asked to serve on the committee. I think the committee did a pretty good job. The numbers are too high. I disagree with the, with the time frame of the pullets should start the 1st of April and should end by the end of May so the fly reduction would be reduced. Uh, again, I, uh, I appreciate uh, all of you looking into this and I would appreciate you, you passing this. Uh, we did a lot of work. We, there are research encompassed the entire nation, not just our area. We looked at, at, at cities from the East Coast to the West Coast, uh, primarily in the West Coast, from here to Seattle, uh, Spokane, all around us. Uh, the norm was more like three hens per family. Uh, so we've been quite generous. And, I, and again, I, uh, I would just really respect you uh, passing this. We have to have some way of controlling this uh, because it's, uh, in some places, it's gotten completely out of hand. And there hasn't been any laws or any rules to, for the code enforcement officer to uh, abide by. He had, he had nothing to go with. So uh, this is at least something. I realize it's going to be hard to enforce, but it's something. It's better than what we had before. Thank you. Mike, if I, will you stay for just a second? Sure. May I ask a question, please? I, I hope you don't get the idea that we're, we don't think you guys worked hard on this, because I think it's a bit of a tough topic. For a long it, time, it has been, <coughs> there's um, a, and there's a lot of there's been disagreements. You know, I I lived on a farm and we've had chickens, and I've got a scar right there from a rooster to prove <coughs> it. Um, I've cleaned a lot of those chicken coops in my lifetime, and I know what you're talking about with smell. I my issue with it at the moment is I know that our one code enforcement person is not likely to be able to keep up with all of the all of the complaints that come in. You you believe that this will give him an, enough and that over time, perhaps those complaints will be reduced if the issues are taken care of? Is that what your committee saw? That's, and I realize that's you were what in the, charge of the committee. You were on the committee. Yes. That's what the committee saw was, uh, was a way for him to at least have a starting place. Because I talked to him several times, and, and he, he told me that he had no place to go. He didn't have any numbers. Uh, when I called and, and complained, it was, really? <laughs> kind of like what you're saying. Seriously. Yeah. And, and, and uh, 10 years ago, I wouldn't have been standing here. I'd have, I'd, have, I'd have thought it was funny. It was silly because I've lived at my 
uh, the same residence since uh, 1989, and I never had a problem. Uh, we've had horses around, and, and I was raised on a farm. Uh, I, uh, I was in 4-H and FFA. I've done all of this, and I've never seen anything like this in my life. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate that. Councillor Stevenson. Thank you. I'm not sure you're the right person to ask, but since you said that you're, you were on the task force, and I know it must have been frustrating to try to come up with a, some way to, to deal with it. Is there any chance, but I also see it being a nightmare to enforce. I mean, I've had issues with neighbors with dogs, and that one poor animal control guy can't even deal with the dog problem, let alone adding all these other animals. Is there a way, and did you explore on the task force, that maybe not at this time implementing more rules, but also figuring out how to deal with the enforcement problem issue. I mean, rather than jump ahead and start with the rules that are going to basically probably be ignored or he'll just get loaded up with complaints and we can't, then we have frustrated citizens. Did you explore maybe trying to do something on the enforcement side? The, Joel didn't really talk about that as being our responsibility. Yeah. As, as members of the task force, we were just to to create some guidelines for for zoning purposes and and for enforcement purposes mr. Bennett what um, how would we go about enforcing this when there's one person for the orchards and downtown well I assume he also does the orchards right well you know we have a very uh, considerable municipal code as it is we have one code yeah. enforcement position uh, we do work on a complaint basis that's the only way it could possibly work. Um, but potentially, um, every time you add a new layer to the code, which requires greater enforcement, um, that makes it more and more difficult to provide that kind of a service with a single position. So would it put pressure on the need for additional enforcement personnel? It might. You have a question, Councillor Daniel. Um. Is there any, that you know, is there any state laws, state health laws, if things are as bad, I, I, I've obviously not, never been to your property, but if it's as bad as it's sounding, is there any laws that you know of as far as state health laws, as far as if there's waste flowing onto his yard or? Mm -hmm. Mr. Mayor, members of council, I'm, not that there might not be, I'm just not familiar with anything that applies inside the city limits, but it's generally left to city regulation. Uh, to regulate the number of animals in, inside the city limits. Uh, there are, health laws that have to do with treatment of the animals, obviously, but none that I'm aware of that would deal with the number of animals you can have or how the sanitary conditions. Okay. Mr. Hill, Mr. Hill, is there anything else you'd like to add on your testimony this evening? Uh, only uh, one, of the, one of the persons that was in favor of poultry uh, actually gave me, I, I don't know if I have it with me tonight, but she actually uh, gave me a, a copy uh, that there, there's actually a, a something with the state of Idaho for an inspection uh, for cleanliness. It has to do with the selling of eggs and and poultry meat. If you sell them. Um, there, it's uh, I forgot the name of it, but I I may have it in my folder. I didn't think to bring it down here with me, but uh, she did she did bring something because she felt for me and. And there is, there are some guidelines for that. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Mayor, I would speculate that that has to do with the actual sale uh, of farm, farm products. R2 most of allow. the, yeah. most of the people that I think would be affected by this ordinance are not people in the business of selling their poultry or their eggs. If they are, there would be some, probably some regulations. But as I understand it and have listened to some of the testimony, most of these people are not in the business of, of selling. So. Thanks, Thank Mike. Uh, Mr. Plask can just probably keep a list of things to address and you'll have a chance to okay. come back up. I just, when I get a chance, I'll just address the enforcement issue. Yeah, yeah. At the end, we'll have you follow up. There may be more. Is there any other testimony for or against this uh, issue? Come on up. And name an address, please. My name is Nick Weatherly, and I live at 3635 12th Street. 
Um, I'm, I'm for poultry, uh, chickens, roosters and such. And I understand the uh, citizens and- I'm sorry, and we all missed your first name. Nick, Nick, Nick Weatherly. Okay. Thank Nick you, Weatherly. Nick. Thirty-six, thirty-five. On this Coast end Street. of the table, at least. Thanks. What's that? On this end of the table, we just all missed your name. Sorry. Okay. Um, so I'm, I'm, I guess you know I've just kind of gotten involved in in this. Uh, my neighbor, I live in the orchards right by Sacagawea. We've all seen the big lot there, the big, large three acres, twelve cows on it. Uh, my neighbor's got cattle just down the street. There's cows and pit, or not pigs, horses and such, all over. It's, and I, it's nice, I like it. You know, the scent comes through sometimes, and that's, I guess that's, I've always seen that as part of living in the orchards. With the chickens, I agree with, with the amendment to the article. You know, it's living within, you gotta keep it clean. You know, if it's not clean, then, then you can't, uh, then it should be illegal. But I think our codes already cover a lot of that, such as like roosters, don't have roosters. Well, don't we already have a noise ordinance in place? So we're adding another amendment to cover just on chickens. But Article 8-3 says that you can't have um, obtrusive noise from, from animals. 8-3, I think, is the one that I was looking at. And then you have 24-41 uh, that, I don't know where that page went. So I guess in a nutshell what I'm looking is is yes, there needs to be maybe what they what it needs to be amended to is is wording in how to manage the you know the, the cleanliness. Like like it says in there with a lot size, you know, having a, a run and, and the size. But to get all specific, I think it's just limiting too much. It's lowest in orchards. It's kinda of what it's about. You know, if you want to be limited, go live downtown. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Any other testimony this evening for or against this issue? One more time. Okay, we'll go ahead and close the hearing. Uh, Mr. Plaskin, you had some follow-up information for council. Yeah, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the enforcement issue. Um, typically on the enforcement side, um, that's not so much dealt with um, in the code itself. It's more of a policy yeah. issue. Yeah. Um, and so that was not, that wasn't, that's not part of this code amendment proposal. Um, I did want to say though that um, what's in place right now for chickens or poultry is, is almost nothing. And there is a certain percentage of any population anywhere that's always going to push the limits or just is going to choose not to comply. Um, and so my feeling is that this proposal will provide some clear standards which will show the community that there are expectations. I think the vast majority of people are, are perfectly understanding of, of what standards are and if, and if they're reasonable, and that's what this public hearing process is about, to establish if they are reasonable, are willing to comply with them. And um, all this is really doing is giving, giving some more reasonable, um, having some reasonable requirements for people to abide by and putting some teeth in the code uh, for the enforcement officer to be able to use on that same percentage of the population that's always going to push the limits anyway. That's, that's my feeling on the matter. Okay. Any other questions, Mr. Plaskin? Okay. Thank you. I see that in the consent agenda we have ordinances 4580 and 4581, I assume we're dealing with these, this uh, information, is that correct? These are the first readings. These be the first readings. Mr. Mayor, mm -hmm. 4581 was separated out from this because it's simply transferring the definition of farming from one place in the code to the other. And okay. so not to get it involved with all of these standards, we just separated those two issues out. Okay. So at this time, that'll, that's where we'll deal with this issue. There's no other action at this time. Is that correct? No other action required at this time. 
until the consent agenda. Right. Correct. Correct. Okay. With that, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Is there any items that council wishes to remove from the camp consent agenda? Councilor Randall. Could we move consent agenda C to the active? Okay. Consent agenda C will be consent agenda H. Wait, no. Active agenda. Active agenda H. Oh, it's G. G. Yeah, or G. Where's F? G. Vouchers payable. Two vouchers payable. Oh, I don't have that on. I've got, got E for it's been it. Revised those. Yeah, six didn't get the revised. Oh, oh, okay. Is that the only thing that's revised? No, it's eco. It's because they had eco. Oh, eco. Okay. Yeah. Which is okay. what F. Yeah, where's eco? Is that it? It is item uh, D. D. Hmm? Contract extension item D is in Delta. D. Oh, okay. Got it. Okay. And then okay. Uh, what's E <coughs> then? E is vouchers payable for Han Rental Han Supply. Okay. F is vouchers payable for Rita Sell and Associates. Okay. And, and so G will G be resolution 2012-30. Any other items? Yes, Council wishes to pull. Councilor Daniel. Item D. Item D. We will make item D, item H. Resolution 40, ordinance 45. Okay. Any other items? Council wishes to move from consent agenda. Hearing none, then I'll entertain a motion to read the consent agenda as amended. Mr. Mayor, I move that we read the consent agenda as amended. Second. It's been moved and seconded to read the consent agenda as amended. Is there any discussion by council? Hearing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. <coughs> motion carries 7 0. Approving the minutes of the June 4, 2012 Joint City Nespers County meeting. June 4th, 2012 work session, and the June 11th, 2012 budget work session. Accepting the minutes of the May 3rd, 2012 Historic Preservation Commission. Approving the first reading of Ordinance 4581 by title only. An ordinance of the City of Lewiston, amending Lewiston City Code, Section 37-3, by adding the definition of farming. Amending Lewiston City Code, Section 37-196, by removing the definition of farming and providing an effective date. And approving the vouchers payable dated June 7, 2012 in the amount of $1,321,199.54. And this excludes payments to Han Rental, Han Supply, and Rita Sill and Associates. Okay. Consent agenda has been read. I'll entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda as read. Mr. Mayor, I move that we approve the consent agenda as read. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve the consent agenda as read. Is there any discussion by council? Hearing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7-0. Move on to the active agenda. First item is resolution 2012-21. Um, Approval of a state local agreement safe routes to school between the city and the Idaho Transportation Department. Mr. Bennett. Thank you, Mayor. Um, this is a resolution that approves a, a grant for additional funding for safe um, routes to schools program. We've received a number of these grants in the past for other areas of the city that uh, need sidewalks to make it safer for kids to get to school. This particular project would take place on Grell Avenue between 18th and 19th in the vicinity of Calum, uh, Camelot Elementary School, and would also uh, uh, help kids that are going to Sacagawea uh, Junior High. Uh, it's approximately $98,000, and um, those funds would be used to uh, construct that project um, for uh, fiscal year 2013. Okay. I'll entertain a motion to read resolution 2012-21. 
So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded to read resolution 2012-21. Is there any discussion by council? Hearing none, those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7 0. Approving resolution 2012 21 by title only. A resolution approving a state local agreement, safe routes to school, between the City of Lewiston and Idaho Transportation Department, authorizing and directing the mayor and city clerk to execute and attest, respectively, said agreement and providing an effective date. Resolution 2012 21 has been read. I'll entertain a motion to approve Resolution 2012-20. Mr. Mayor. Councilor Randall. I'd like to request a roll call vote. Okay. We can do a roll call vote. Mr. Mayor, I move that we adopt Resolution 2012-21. Second. It's been moved and seconded to approve <coughs> Resolution 2012-21. Councilor Randall. How do you vote? Yay. Councilor Kleberg. Yay. Councillor Stevenson. Yay. 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 Motion carries 7 0. Next item business.